Hi, and welcome to another edition of If This Car Could Talk. This week's feature car is one I'm sure all of my viewers will thoroughly enjoy. Mikey Jones' 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air four-door sedan. I love this car because it's so well done, and it also has a compelling story. This beauty includes modern touches like a 350 engine with a turbo 400 three-speed automatic, power front disc brakes, rack and pinion steering, and a tilt steering column topped by an original appearing but downsized 15-inch steering wheel, all very subtly disguised under the classic sheet metal of GM's sales leader for the 1957 model year. I'll let Mikey tell you about his pride and joy. I bought my 1957 Bel Air in August of 1996. I was 14 years old and didn't even have a learner's permit. But I had my first job for about a year at that point and I saved up some money and I wanted to restore a car. I had looked at several other cars because I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to have a 1957 Bel Air even though it was always one that I wanted. My car had been sitting in a barn in Kissimmee, Florida since 1970 purchased by the second owner of the car and I saw that car there for years and finally I said let me go ahead and put a note on this person's mailbox to see if I could purchase the car from him. My dad told me well if that guy wanted to sell that car he'd have a for sale sign on it so don't expect to hear anything from him. But sure enough that night the very same day that I put the note in the mailbox he gave me a call and told me he would sell the car to me for a thousand dollars. He had had the car sitting in his barn for so long that he didn't even have the keys to it anymore. So we had to have it towed to my house. What's great is I can tell a lot of people that my first car was my 57 Bel Air. Now it wasn't the first car that I drove so it does have an asterisk because I didn't drive it for the first time until 15 years after I purchased it. That's how long it took me to restore the vehicle. But I can still say, without lying, that my first car was my 1957 Bel Air. My love for the 57 Chevy started much earlier than when I was 14 years old. The first time I ever saw one was in a movie called The Heavenly Kid. And that was my first experience of seeing a, a 57 Chevy and I just absolutely fell in love with it. The first time I ever saw the car, I told my dad I'm gonna have a car like that one day and he said, good luck because everybody wants a car like that one day. And um, it, I, I proved him wrong that I could have one. Quite frankly, um, at the time when I first bought the car, I would have preferred it to have been a two door. But as time has progressed and I've done a lot of work on this car and enjoyed it for many of years. I actually prefer four doors over a two door. Especially because now I am a family man. I have a wife and two kids and I like to take the whole family out for a ride in a Bel Air. And it's a lot easier to drive the family and get them in and out of the car in a four door than it is to get them in a two door. Also, I love four doors so much that I have recently purchased a second four-door 57 Chevy. The second one happens to be a four-door hardtop. My current one that is finished is a four-door sedan. I learned that this car was built in Atlanta, Georgia on March 16th of 1957. Ironically, both my wife and my son are born on March 16th as well. So it's kind of perfect that my car was built on the same day as both my wife and my son were born. Uh, it was like it was destined to be. The condition it was in was terrible when I first got it. Um, as I'd said, it was built in Atlanta, Georgia, um, but sold in Orlando, Florida, or Kissimmee, Florida. And for those of you who have never been to Florida or Daytona, um, even to this day, you can still drive your vehicle on Daytona Beach. And as you might know, salt in the sand from the ocean will destroy the metal on a vehicle. 
So at some point in my vehicle's life, definitely probably by the first owner, it had been driven on the beach quite a bit. And I could tell because the entire trunk was rusted out and the frame was caked in sand. It originally came in the Canyon Coral Pink and Indian Ivory Roof. I was not going to own a pink vehicle. I found a color code off of a 1997 Pontiac Grand Am, uh, which was a nice red that I really enjoyed. And the reason why I picked 1997 Pontiac Grand Am was because my sister had one of those. And I said, you know what, that's a pretty color. I want that on my car. The car originally came with the 235 straight six with a three-speed transmission, standard transmission, three on a tree. Um, and actually the car, the car kept that motor for many of years. Um, in fact, the car was painted, the interior was done, and the car was complete with that six cylinder. Until one day, a friend of mine who had a 1979 three quarter ton van Chevy truck, or Chevy, yeah, Chevy van, that had a 350 in it with a 400 transmission. I asked him, I said, hey, what are you gonna do with that van? He said, well, I'm gonna junk it. And I said, well, can I have the drivetrain out of it? He said to me, if you pull it, you can have it. So I went down to Harbor Freight, I bought myself a engine hoist, and I spent a weekend pulling that motor out of that van. Um, decided to go ahead and rebuild it and drop it in the 57. And honestly, I thought that was gonna be the hard part, but getting that motor and transmission in that car was really easy. It was everything after the fact. Um, because also, I said, well, since I'm going to be pulling the motor out, uh, let me go ahead and upgrade the, upgrade the steering. So I put rack and pinion steering in it. And since I'm going to be doing the steering, let me go ahead and put disc brakes in the front. I did that. Because I added the rack and pinion steering, I then needed a different exhaust manifold so that the steering linkage could clear my exhaust. And that had to be out of a 1965 Chevy truck left side exhaust manifold because it was the only one that was still a ram head exhaust manifold like the original from 57 but had a 45 degree angle rather than a 90 degree angle out to clear my steering linkage. I don't know if I have any future plans for my car but I've also been saying that ever since I had it quote unquote finished and just about every year since I've had it finished, I've added something new to it. Um, for example, I added my fender skirts to it four years ago. I added front bumper guards to it a couple years before that. Um, I replaced the 18 inch steering wheel with a 15 inch reproduction steering wheel. Luckily though, I highly doubt I will be adding anything else to it because I do have the second 57 and I've decided that anything I wanted to add to another to a 57 Chevy, I can go ahead and do with the second vehicle um, so I don't have to keep tinkering with the first one. Um, but future plans for that second one, I would like to add a Continental kit to it. Um, and definitely with the second one, I am going to put air conditioning in it because my first one currently does not. And here in the Phoenix Valley, it can be really miserable to try to drive that vehicle with no AC. Um, so definitely my second one will have air conditioning in it. It's iconic. Nobody thinks of the 1950s and doesn't at some point think of a 1957 Chevy it just it's to me it's a beautiful car the lines are perfect the fins are done with class I I just absolutely love driving the car around and getting thumbs up and nods from people I drive by that just love looking at it that's in my opinion that's part of the reason why we restore these cars because we enjoy seeing people enjoying our cars and to, to me that's just wonderful you know I'm, I'm really looking forward to hopefully my son being into cars as much as i am uh, it's 
part of the reason why I actually purchased the second 57 because I restored my first one with my dad and I would like to have that same experience and build those memories with my son with the second one um, along with my dad as well so the three of us can work on it together and I'm really excited about that which by the way that one I will be doing a tropical turquoise with Indian ivory roof on it the 1957 Chevrolet is a car which was introduced by General Motors Chevrolet Division in September of 1956. It was available in three well-defined series, the upscale Bel Air, the mid-range 210, and the base 150. In an original sales publication, here's what Chevrolet had to say about the now legendary Bel Air for this year. Quote, with the new integrated appearance and skillful use of exterior ornamentation, which includes subtle touches of gold, Bel Air models for 1957 are outstanding examples of luxury in good taste. All components emphasize massiveness, width, and vehicle length, and contribute to the luxurious appearance of the 1957 Chevrolet." Unquote. Initially, GM's top brass wanted an entirely new car for 1957, but many different production challenges dictated that the previous two years' basic design be refreshed again for one more sales season. Ed Cole, who was the chief engineer for the Chevrolet division during that time, specified a series of radical updates that significantly increased the cost of the car. Changes include a new dashboard and a new sealed cowl due to the relocation of air ducts behind the headlight pods, which happily resulted in the distinctive chrome headlight bezels that are only seen on these particular cars. Another benefit to the lower cowl was increased visibility through the windshield. 14-inch wheels with all-new lower pressure tubeless tires replaced the 15-inch wheels from previous years to give the car a lower stance and improved ride. And braking capabilities were also improved. Some additional design changes to the frame, like increasing the rear axle's vertical travel, gave these cars better handling. Another huge advancement for electrical systems were innovated this year by designing all new wiring harnesses that were joined together by bulkhead connectors. This made assembling the cars quicker and made servicing electrical issues much simpler. From a number standpoint, the 57 Chevrolet wasn't nearly as popular as General Motors had hoped. During the two previous years, now commonly known as the Tri-5 era, sales dipped from one year to the next. Total passenger car production, including the sedan delivery, but not the Corvette, totaled up like this. For the 1955 model year, total sales ended up at 1,712,804 units. The following year, sales dropped to 1,444,792 cars, a decrease of over 15%. Sales were up slightly for 1957 when Chevrolet tallied 1,508,000 931 cars sold, an increase of about 4.5% over 1956. Despite its popularity, Longtime rival Ford outsold Chevrolet for this model year for the first time since 1935. Ford's 1957 introduction of its all new body styling that was longer, lower, and wider than the previous year's offerings helped Ford take the sales lead for the year. The exterior looked completely new from top to bottom. An ingeniously designed front fascia looked like no other car on the road that year or any previously either. Out back, the infamous quarter panel tail fins, tail lamps, die cast chrome ornamentation, and larger bumper all were harmoniously integrated to duplicate the wide look seen in the front. All Bel Air models, though maintaining the same chassis, 
powertrains, and bodies as the other two lower series offerings were given upscale gold trim on the aluminum grille mesh insert, the Zix front fender chevrons, and the Chevrolet emblems on the hood and deck were all now rendered in anodized gold. It was certainly distinctive and just understated enough to class up the top of the line Bel Air models from their 210 and 150 series brethren. Unlike most competitors, the Chevrolet four-door hardtop featured a reinforced rear roof structure that gave the car needed additional rigidity and inadvertently created a visually pleasing appearance in silhouette. The 57 Chevrolets were called baby Cadillacs by many people because of their unapologetic use of various styling cues from their corporate big brother Cadillac division. Like the Caddies, V8 option cars got a large V under the Chevrolet script on the hood and trunk lid. This special ornamentation was gold anodized for the Bel Air series only, but chrome plated for the 210 and 150 series offerings. For the third year, the incomparable Bel Air Nomad had its own distinguished styling, mainly in the roof line and rear deck. These cars shared their roofs and tailgates with the Pontiac Safari wagons of the time to keep engineering and tooling costs down. A unique model for this year was the Del Rey, a basic two-door sedan but sporting a luxury deluxe interior. Our feature car this week looks really sharp in its two-tone color scheme of India Ivory over Matador Red. Chevrolet offered 12 different colors, plus three exclusive colors for the soft top cars that could all be configured in many different two-tone color combinations. And along with available interior motifs, a new car buyer could customize his car precisely to his liking. In addition to new colors, models, engines, transmissions, and a one-of-a-kind visual overhaul, there were many options available, both factory installed or available exclusively at your local friendly Chevy dealer. Most were designed to make the car more comfortable to drive, like power brakes, steering, seats, and windows, along with air conditioning, although that was rarely ordered. Appearance and practical items like bumper guards and Continental kits were also very popular. A locking gas cap, a compass, a tissue dispenser, plate frame, door edge guards, floor mats, and exterior mirrors were just some of the huge variety of dealer accessories one could buy from any authorized Chevy dealership. In the audio department, these now classic cars could be equipped with a signal-seeking AM radio utilizing a power antenna. These radios now use tubes that required only 12 volts of plate voltage and a transistor for the output stage. This lowered the power drain on the battery to an insignificant amount when the engine was off. Playing the radio with conventional tubes for extended periods occasionally drained the battery to the extent that it wouldn't restart the car. Now you could sit in your car with your significant other and listen to the latest rock and roll tunes without needing a jump when you were ready to go home. Continuing the latest audio technology, a rear speaker could be purchased which required a separate volume knob to be installed in the dashboard near the radio. This speaker was touted as providing surround sound. It actually had more of a delayed echo effect. The clock was electrically self-winding and a car's owner was required to move the hands to the correct time on several occasions, after which the display time would be remarkably accurate. Another option, which is also seen on our feature car, is a dashboard mounted traffic light viewer, a ribbed plastic visor that was installed just above the speedometer. This device is very helpful because the front section of the top of these cars extends so far forward of the driver. It's difficult to see a traffic signal's color. The viewer allows the driver to see past the edge of the roof without leaning forward. In 1957, the auto industry had begun to really put an emphasis on safety by installing padded dashes and visors, recessed hubs on steering wheels, 
crash proof door locks and seat belts among other things. Some of these features were standard, some optional depending on the year, make and model. It seems that styling and horsepower enamored the car buying public more than safety features like these. It wouldn't be until the next decade that the federal government would begin mandating safety features for all vehicles. Well enough about all these classic cars and many features. If you're like me, what interests us most is what's under that hood. And believe me, the Chevrolet lineup in 1957 had a lot to be excited about. Two engines from previous years continued to reliably power many a 57 Chevy. The standard power plant was the tried and true, nearly indestructible Blue Flame 6, a 235 Cuber producing 140 horsepower that was by now motivating countless numbers of Chevy cars and trucks, as well as the new for 55 small block V8 displacing 265 cubic inches. The two barrel Turbo Fire 283 produced 185 horsepower while a four barrel carbureted engine was known as Super Turbo Fire which effortlessly added 35 ponies to the power rating making it 220. All other optional performance oriented 283's were called the Corvette V8. The first was standard with twin four barrel carburetors. It put out 245 horses but the competition version which used the now legendary Duntov cam that actuated solid valve lifters produced 270 horsepower. Although when properly tuned and running optimally the power output was no doubt much more. The most exciting news for small block Chevy fans was the 283 topped by a Rochester mechanical fuel injection unit. Also part of the Corvette V8 family this engine was fitted with the cam and solid lifters of the Super Turbo Fire 283s. With this new fuel injection induction, it was rated at 283 horses and relieved a buyer of $500 to get it. This would be the first time in General Motors history where a vehicle achieved one horsepower per cubic inch in a regular production model. This would prove to be a huge showroom draw even if a buyer ended up with a 150 four-door sedan powered by a Blue Flame 6. This was the third US built production V8 to produce the one horsepower per cubic inch. So this was quickly escalating into an all-out horsepower war between the manufacturers. They battled it out on NASCAR tracks, drag strips, and road courses all over the country in a time that's still the most enticing era for many car enthusiasts. It's commonly referred to as the muscle car era and it ended way too soon. No amount of horsepower is worth anything unless a reliable transmission can put the power to the rear wheels. Choices abounded for the 57 Chevrolet. All cars were standard with a column mounted 3-speed manual gearbox and an overdrive unit was available as an option on cars so equipped. At the end of May in 1957, GM offered a four-speed manual transmission through its dealer network as an over-the-counter option at the amazingly reasonable price of $188, but no installation kit was ever offered, so it's doubtful that many of these conversions were ever completed successfully. 1957 was also Chevrolet's first offering of a new transmission known as the Turbo Glide. It was a design concept based off a gearbox that Buick had developed a decade earlier with their innovative Dynaflow Automatic. This tranny quickly gained a bad reputation for reliability due to its complexity. Most automatic transmission buyers shunned the Turbo Glide in favor of the two-speed, tried-and-true Power Glide in production since 1950. At the time, the Turbo Glide casing was the largest cast aluminum component ever put into mass production. It never really recovered from the tainted reputation it got, and soon it was discontinued by 1961. 
Here's an interesting tidbit about the turbo glides. The power glide shifter went from park to neutral to drive to low to reverse, while the turbo glide was park, reverse, neutral, drive, and HR. Although the HR was changed early in production to GR, meaning grade retarder, because drivers mistakenly believed that HR meant high range instead of the correct hill retarder. Over the years, these cars were plentiful and cheap, so early hot rodders could easily find a factory V8 car. And with a burgeoning speed parts industry, it was easy and inexpensive to make them perform extremely well. Plus, they have timeless styling and a charisma that's hard to beat. This is how legends are born. The 57s, and undoubtedly the other two previous years, all became popular for the same reasons. Now, they've become an integral part of the American experience. Even non-car people can identify a 57 Chevy in a quick glance. In the 57 chassis, the small block V8 engine was positioned directly behind the center line of the front wheels, making this car a superior handler on short tracks and dirt tracks. This distinct advantage earned the 57 the nickname King of the Short Tracks. Powered by a fuel-injected 283, a 150 model two-door sedan painted black and white and called the Black Widow was the first car to ever be outlawed by NASCAR because it proved to be nearly unbeatable. In other forms of racing, they were still the car to beat for years. The 57s subsequently were used up for stock car racing at a very high rate. But surprisingly though, the 57 Chevy was also known to win a disproportionate amount of demolition derbies because the radiator was set back a good bit from the grill, making these cars nearly impossible to disable. The additional advantage that these cars had over any of their competitors is that they employed the last double line trunk. Couple all that with a bulletproof chassis and drivetrain and you've got tons of hard to beat demo derby contestants winning in countless dirt floor arenas. Mercifully, by the 1970s, the 57 Chevy had reached the status of a desirable and collectible automobile. No more derbies for these classic Chevys. Today there is an incredible support system of clubs, parts suppliers, and builders who try to keep up with the public's never-ending demand for these fabulous cars. There's even a manufacturer that's supplying Tri-5 buffs with complete all-steel bodies in two-door hardtop, sedan, and convertible body styles. There are also chassis suppliers that offer highly engineered designs that will take nearly any engine you can imagine. Luckily, these cars easily accept big blocks and even LS engines with little to no modifications and any part you can imagine is just a catalog order away. Although the 58 Chevrolet is an attractive car and the year that the legendary Impala debuted, these cars will never reach the untouchable status of the cars from the Tri-5 era, particularly the 57s. Many thanks to Mikey Jones for taking the time to show off his gorgeous 57 Chevy Bel Air to all of my new friends on YouTube. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you never miss my weekly videos. I also welcome your comments. If you have a vehicle with a fascinating story that you'd like me to showcase, you can email me at ifthiscarcouldtalk at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see it here and share your story with the world. Until next time, 